Hey everyone, Charlie here from the Atomic Age, and uh, I just wanted to do a quick follow-up to Chernobyl Part 5. I know it's been a little while since that video came out, but let's do it now. This is something I want to get done uh, before we can move on to some other stuff here. Alright, there were several comments uh, addressing my dismissal of the of Legasov's claim that Chernobyl Number 4 is now a nuclear bomb. It was not. Uh, so let's... I want to make a video getting into the technical aspects of this. We're not going to do it now because that's going to be... That's going to take a good bit of preparation, but I kind of just want to address it semantically. Uh, let's just start off first of all with the, with the fact that a nuclear bomb cannot happen by accident. And uh, a, a, for a nuclear explosion to happen in a reactor would be by accident. And by that I mean by chance, by happenstance. A nuclear bomb has to be purposefully designed. There just has to be so many different design features that all have to line up and be purposefully chosen in such a manner that to, to make a nuclear bomb that uh, a nuclear reactor still does not count in that regard. All right, so that's as much as I want to brush on the technical. I just want to address the semantics of bombs. So a bomb is a weapon of war. It is something designed to inflict harm on someone, which a reactor is not. A reactor produces energy uh, to provide electricity for people. So even calling it a dirty bomb is still a misnomer because it's still not a bomb. It's similar to a dirty bomb. Chernobyl blowing up is actually worse than a dirty bomb. There's so much more radioactivity in a reactor than in a dirty bomb, which is a type of nuclear bomb. Okay, so now let's address Legasov uh, mentioning that uh, his actual phrase that Chernobyl number four is now a nuclear bomb and then AZ-5 is the trigger. Chernobyl reactor four is now a nuclear bomb. No one in the room that night knew the shutdown button could act as a detonator. Legasov has been building up his credibility this whole time through the show as to being a person you can trust. So for him to say something this uh, sensational and exaggerated at this point, because it's just not true. So why not just say Chernobyl number four is now ready to explode and AZ-5 is the spark? That is perfectly legitimate to say because it did explode, but it wasn't a nuclear explosion. It wasn't a nuclear bomb. So that's just where it really irks me. But this this could be because this trial, uh, while it did happen, Legasov was not a part of it. I'm going to guess this is just uh, sensational writing. Uh, people have mentioned in the past, you know, talking to like Soviet bureaucrats, you got to use this flowery language or whatever. I don't care. Like, it's just it's not right. Like explosion is just saying that it's ready to explode and that AZ-5 is a spark is like that's perfect. That's not like good enough for you. You got to start making these outlandish claims. So I don't buy it. That is really just like my one major problem with the finale. But on the whole, I still think it's great. And uh, yeah, I'm at some point I will make a, a technical video talking about why it was not a nuclear explosion or a nuclear bomb. All right, here we have this comment from Frank talking about changes were made to the reactors besides the more enriched fuel. Uh, if I remember correctly, some of the changes that were implemented quite quickly was the insertion of the rods was made much faster. Yeah, so according to the INSAG-7 report from the IAEA, uh, International Atomic Energy Agency, the original time for full control rod insertion in the RBMK was 18 seconds. And then uh, in response to the accident, they reduced that time to 12 seconds. So what was that like a 33% reduction? And then uh, in addition, they also, I think I mentioned it in the Chernobyl Part 5 video, but they... Well, I think that image I put up there, I guess I'll put that up here again. It showed that they, they moved the control rod position so that there wouldn't be that column, that like one and a half meter column of water below the uh, the graphite displacer at the bottom of the reactor there. So when you add the higher enriched fuel, I think I mentioned this in Chernobyl part five, but I'll mention it again. Uh, you have to counteract that with more neutron absorbers because uh, the way the reactor is designed, you can't just add more enriched fuel and expect nothing else to happen. You have to counteract it. So you add more fixed neutron absorbers, which is what they did. So this uh, also had the effect of, uh, or the intended effect of greatly reducing the uh, the positive void coefficient in the uh, the situation that Chernobyl number four found itself in, where the positive void coefficient was driving the power coefficient to be positive. All right, here from Matt Hayward. Uh, I, I missed the opportunity for a fantastic joke. Thank you for that Half-Life reference. <laughs> All right, so we got two comments here from Reader Stuff and V44N regarding my discussion of uh, the Fukushima containment buildings and what happened with those explosions. And uh, 
I want to thank them for bringing this up because this is a, a misconception that I had as well. Uh, so reader stuff here says Fukushima did not have proper containment buildings. And then V44N here says uh, in Fukushima, the containment building didn't blow up. It was the exterior part after releasing the gas out of the what he calls the containment building. It's actually called like just to get nitpicky, the primary containment vessel. So let's take a look at the type of BWR that was at Fukushima. All right, so here we're looking at the Mark One BWR containment for uh, that GE design of BWR reactors. So the part in purple here is the primary containment boundary. As you can see, it's it's pretty small compared to like uh, in the China Syndrome. That that whole big outer building was the the containment building there, and that is how it how the containment works for modern nuclear reactors. Is that, that that big dome soda can looking building is what contains all the it's designed to contain all the, the coolant flashing to steam in the event of a loss of coolant accident. So you can see in the BWR Mark 1 here, this is a, a rather small volume, so that means any release will have a much greater increase in pressure than on a more modern containment building design type. So this part in purple here is not what exploded at Fukushima. Another part that contributed to Fukushima is that boiling water reactors have a lot more zirconium in them than pressurized water reactors of the same power level. So a BWR is more prone, or for, you know, the same power level design is more susceptible to generate, or is more likely to generate more hydrogen gas in a, in a severe accident scenario than a PWR. So what happened here with Fukushima is that they vented the hydrogen gas buildup from this purple region to this outer square looking region here. And that is the secondary containment building. So, uh, the top, the top there you can see is, uh, if you've seen pictures of the Fukushima accident, I'll bring those up. Uh, that little top third part is what blew off. That's where the hydrogen gas was vented to. They were unable to properly vent those buildings as well. So the hydrogen built up and blew up in those buildings and blew those out. So the containments did not explode. That was all for that comment I made regarding containments exploding in uh, Chernobyl part five there. So, it was not actually that good of an example to bring up. It was actually a pretty bad example. Containment buildings are designed to handle all the coolant in the primary loop flashing the steam. Containment buildings are also designed to withstand like missile and airplane strikes. They are not inherently designed for containing meltdowns or hydrogen explosions. That does not mean that they can't. Due to the, the robustness and the safety margin in handling all the coolant flashing to steam, uh, there will be robustness in containing meltdowns, and that's that was that was uh, discussed in my China Syndrome video, where uh, the meltdowns were allowed to proceed uncontrolled for a few hours. Allowed is not really the right word; it just kind of it was just uncontrolled for a short amount of time, a relatively short amount of time, but did not penetrate uh, those uh, containment structures at Fukushima. But yeah, so this was a a very early containment design in the nuclear industry. There were issues with the assumed safety features of this containment structure initially. Uh, but this is all corrected in subsequent reactor designs, and then these types of BWRs uh, have been backfitted with safety features to make uh, these containment structures more acceptable. Alright guys, so there you go. Follow up to Chernobyl Part 5. Hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, coming up soon, I want to start my reactor series, uh, whiteboard for reactor series. I think I'm going to start out pretty basic at first. I'm going to make an intro video that kind of outlines reactors, and then I want to see where you guys want to go with it, because I could just make a series to show what I know about reactors, but that's not the point. I want to see what you guys want to know, so we'll start with one video and then go from there. I have a rough outline of how I want to handle the whole series. Really kind of want to start with the, with the basics of it and cover the, the basic components of a reactor before heading out into... Uh, what kind of reactor designs there have been over the years, why have certain designs prevailed over others, what's the future look like, what does the present look like for nuclear reactors, and then there's other concerns too, like fuel cycle, like how do you make fuel for these reactors, how do you handle the spent waste, there's a lot of things to talk about. Um, so it, it, it'll be a good series, but I'm gonna, it's going to be more, uh, I want you guys to tell me where you would like it to go as opposed to me just uh, putting out my own series without any regard to what interests you guys in particular, or perhaps minimal, or not necessarily uh, the same things are interesting to you and me. But anyway, that's coming up, and then I'm gonna talk about this Three Mile Island Netflix documentary soon, but I wanna 
read up a bit more on Three Mile Island first, get my get my uh, my facts and background info straight before diving into that. Several major nuclear organizations, I think, have put out rebuttals to that show, so worth checking out. I know in the China Central video there was a, a pretty big comment thread talking about it, but I wanted to avoid it so I could uh, go into the documentary cold there. But I, before I l could look away, I, I, I noticed someone said something about trying to make it look kind of like Chernobyl, which is by no means at all what happened at Three Mile Island. So I'm also doing a research, a series of research streams on the 2008 game Fallout 3, which takes place in the nuclear post-apocalypse. And I want to address their representations of nuclear physics in a video. So be sure to check out that stream if you haven't. Link to my Twitch channel below, streaming it over there. And uh, it's been a lot of fun so far. There's going to be a lot to talk about. But uh, yeah, thank you guys for watching and I'll see you guys next time.